in the uh, history department at the University of Chicago, along with Misha Peltova, uh, postdoctoral teaching fellow in history and gender and sexuality studies. Um, I'm a coordinator of today's event. Uh, we're both delighted to welcome you. Uh, today is the first of a series of three workshops that will collectively analyze the rise of anti-gender and anti-LGBTQ plus movements as a global social and political phenomenon. The series considers these movements as pressing subjects of historical, pedagogical, uh, and comparative investigation. Together, we will be tracking the manifestations of anti-gender and anti-LGBTQ plus politics in the Americas, Africa, Asia, and Europe. We meet today under the heading Anti-Gender and Anti-LGBTQ Plus Politics in Central and Eastern Europe, Historical Continuities, Transnational Connections, Contested Futures. Our esteemed panel will bring focus on historical and contemporary developments in Hungary, Poland, Romania, as well as in the Soviet Union and in post-Soviet states. In one week's time, on Friday, May 20th, we'll meet again. The goal of the second workshop is to discuss and collaboratively develop teaching strategies to engage students on today's topics. This event is titled Pedagogies of Populism and Anti-Gender Politics in Central and Eastern Europe. Um, so for more inter, uh, information on this event, um, uh, I believe Misha will share a link now uh, in the chat box. Finally, we'd like to encourage you to mark your calendars for the third and final event of the series. Uh, this will be a day-long hybrid conference uh, to be held at the University of Chicago on October 28, 2022. Uh, we look forward to meeting as many of you as can make it on that day. The October conference will bring in additional global dimensions to the series. Our invited speakers will offer a comparative analysis of anti-gender and anti-LGBTQ plus uh, movements across different geographic regions. While shifting in scale, we will continue to consider the entanglement of legal advocacy, resource sharing, populist politics, and so on that make these movements such a powerful and unevenly coordinated global force today. Um, I'd also like to take a moment to uh, acknowledge our institutional sponsors uh, who are making this workshop series possible. Uh, we are sponsored by the Center for Eastern European and Russian and Eurasian Studies at the University of Chicago. Um, and there I would like to extend a particular thank you to Associate Director Esther Peters uh, for her trust and enthusiasm um, from the very beginning of the planning of this series. Uh, we're also here today thanks to the generous support uh, from the Title VI National Resource Center grants from the U.S. Department of Education. The series is co-sponsored by the Center for the Study of Gender and Sexuality, the Posen Center for Human Rights, the University of Chicago Department of History, and the Transnational Approaches to Modern Europe workshop at the University of Chicago. We'd like to thank them all. So Zoom protocols. Um, now allow me just to say a few words about the Zoom webinar format. Um, we encourage you to post questions to the Q&A box, uh, which you will find at the bottom of your window. Please feel free to post these questions as they arise during each talk. Our moderator, Professor Susan Gal, will direct your questions to the panelists as we move to the Q&A component. Uh, you will also have the ability to upload questions you would like to draw our attention to in the queue. So um, I'm now delighted to launch today's discussion by introducing our first speaker, Eva Fodor. Eva Fodor is professor of gender studies at Central European University and is a member of the university's senior leadership team as pro-rector for foresight and analysis. Professor Fodor's research engages the field of comparative social inequalities. Her work focuses upon how gender is negotiated within labor markets in different societies and social contexts and shapes these in turn. She is the author of an extensive list of publications uh, to highlight just two monographs. Professor Fodor published Working Difference, Women's Working Lives in Hungary and Austria, 1945 to 1995 in 2003. And this year published The Gender Regime in Anti-Liberal Hungary, which is available in open access format. Her current research project investigates the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic 
on the division of care work and the transformation of the labor market during and following the pandemic. Uh, so with that, I will turn the floor over to Professor Fodor. Thank you. Thank you for this very kind introduction. And thank you for um, inviting me and organizing this fascinating panel. I'm, I'm really honored to be here and excited to, to hear everybody else's, uh, else's papers. But let me start with mine and let me start uh, by sharing my screen. It worked before, so let's hope it works again. Here it is. Yes. There we go. So the title of my paper is Family in the Service of Biopolitics, Continuities and Discontinuities in Hungary and Beyond. And this is um, um, uh, to some extent a part of uh, the book. Uh, uh, that was meant that Roy mentioned before um, uh, the gender of uh, anti-liberal Hungary. Um, let me start um, with a question that I'd like you to, to answer to yourselves. To, here it is. Do you support the popularization of gender reassignment treatments to underage children without parental consent? Yes or no? Got, you got your answer? Um, I know, I know that this is a silly question, but still, this is one of four that Hungarians had to answer on April 3rd, not such a long time ago, as part of a national referendum. The national referendum accompanied the national elections. And uh, although the referendum did not get enough votes to pass, unlike, unfortunately, the ruling Hungarian um, uh, anti-liberal party, but still millions of people took this question seriously, the four questions seriously, and dutifully answered no. Now, Hungarians may have come late to what we now call, amongst ourselves and, uh, and publicly too, anti-gender discourse. Um, it has lots of meanings, but um, loosely, um, we sort of know what we're talking about. Hungarians started on this very late, but as you can see, we have caught up by uh, the spring of 2022. There are several elements of, uh, of this um, type of, uh, of, of uh, talking about uh, gender that you find here. And that, that, so, so the several elements of this uh, political movement or political mobilization uh, strategy that you find here. The concern about the sexual education of children, the focus on sex and gender reassignment that's also, that's, that often pops up um, in these movements. And the method to the tone that indicates a threat of this, that reassignment treatment um, popularized to underage children actually happening on a daily basis. So all of these are familiar, but I think that there's a less often noted hidden message here too. And it has to do with the importance of the family, the family as the primary unit of society, the main target of social action, the main source of social citizenship. Prime Minister Viktor Orban spelled this out several times. Here's a quote from a television interview from 2021, where um, this is very clearly formulated. It says, let me read this out to you. Western Europeans decided that it is the state's prerogative to restrict parents' rights over their children and to allow NGOs and state schools to teach children at the very early age about sexual and gender issues. We, and here, it is unclear what he means by we, the government or he himself or he and his friends. We believe that it is our right as parents not to expose our children to these things. We, and I'm pretty sure that here this is the government, we the government prioritize parents' rights over the rights of schools or the state. So he's arguing here for the rights of parents and families to overrule the decision of schools or even the state. Now, this is really bizarre if you actually think about this. The leader of the country, the prime minister of the country, is basically saying that parents should and could ignore state policies if they so choose. Now, um, to be fair, he, I, and this makes it a little less absurd, uh, he means this in this rather restricted sense, in this very restricted context, uh, in the case of sexual education and sexual education to children. So the scope is limited, but the quote and the thought and the idea behind it is still important. My argument today in here and in this really short discussion and in the paper is that the Orban government, which calls itself an illiberal democracy, has increasingly designated the family as the basic unit of society. Importantly, 
the family is extremely narrowly defined. And you will see that in later slides, I'm going to put the family in quotation marks to indicate that this, we're not talking about any family, but we're talking about a very specific family. So it's very, it's narrowly defined and includes only heterosexual married working couples with children. It is this unit that serves as the central subject of biopolitics. Um, and of course the goal of this bio, the Hungarian biopolitics is to increase the size and to some extent also to improve the quality of the population and to strengthen the Hungarian nation. For this, the family is an essential unit. So this, I argue, built on Hungarians long held faith in this type of family unit. So in this sense, this is a continuity from Hungary's past, the state socialist past too. But at the same time, it's also a conscious rejection of the communist and state socialist approach to the family. So let me explain that um, uh, briefly. Marx and Engels, and then following them, um, um, Lenin, uh, Alexander Kollontai, and many others expected that the bourgeois family will disappear with the advent of communism. There are lots of uh, places where we can read about this. But lest you think that this was popular only before World War II or only in the Soviet Union, I want to point out that Hungarian left-wing intellectuals made very similar arguments in the 1970s too. So in general, uh, however, socialist, state socialist policymakers were more hesitant. So they did not talk about the disappearance of, of the family. But numerous policy measures and official state propaganda indicated the goal of sort of reducing the significance of, of, of the family in people's lives and certainly in the in, in, in political life or in, in, um, in, um, in distributing social resources. I don't want to go into this uh, in a lot of detail. I described this, uh, this in more detail in the paper. Um, but in addition, I, I do want to point out this uh, sort of ironic situation that in addition, state socialist policymakers in Hungary were really suspicious of the family. And in fact, argued that women were politically less reliable than men exactly because of their, their close ties to the family and their inability to separate themselves from, from the family. Now, like a self-fulfilling prophecy, the family did indeed become the locus of political resistance or anti-politics as, as it was called. Um, something that of course state socialist party leaders really had a legitimate reason to fear. But the family was important not only for urban dissident intellectuals. According to opinion polls, Hungarians held very strong views about the importance of marriage and having children under state socialism as pretty much as they do now. Already in 1989, and Hungary is one of the only countries where um, such polls um, um, existed, and certainly from the 2000s onwards, many more Hungarians than say Austrians or people from other countries believed that even a bad marriage was better than none, or that life without children um, was completely meaningless. Several other indicators also show that Hungarians attributed much more importance to the heterosexual family unit than people in most other countries. So the concept and the reality of the family was extremely meaningful under state socialism as well. It is it obvious it was also where most reproductive labor took place, right? So that did not change a whole lot, especially after the 1970s. And it was also therefore the crucial site of the production of gender. Nevertheless, and this is a point I want to make, social rights could not be claimed on the basis of family membership. The family, this was not part of, of um, a policy making discourse, certainly not as much as it is now. So let's skip to the 1990s and let's skip the 1990s and the first decade of the 21st century now, which is the time when neoliberally minded social policies, at least, you know, to quote Lynn Haney, constructed the notion of the needy individual, right? And made him or her the target of social policies, which were designed merely to, to, to reduce deprivation a bit. The economic recession of 2008 exacerbated the deep inequalities already existing and vulnerabilities already um, um, existing um, in these countries that resulted from this practice. So enter Viktor Orban. This is the context when Viktor Orban came to power in 2010 and his government immediately introduced a new principle of governing. One that placed the slogan, God, family, nation, and work. Sometimes the work element is forgotten, but I think it is very important. Place it, so they place this into the, in the center 
of, um, of governing. This phrase, this slogan is repeated um, regularly in, um, in, in, um, a, a, by political, uh, in political discourse. Now, in sharp contrast to the stingy social benefits allocated to individuals on the basis of need, as it was the practice before, the heterosexual middle-class working family was declared worthy of substantial social support. Indeed, state protection, explicit state protection. This move represented a sharp discontinuity with the past in the basic architecture of social citizenship rights and in public discourse. Uh, take a look at the poster. There are many of these uh, giant posters of, of this kind are all over uh, Hungary, um, depicting the family, popularizing the notion of the family, acknowledging the importance of the, of the family and focusing on the family as, um, as, as an important social and then of course, political um, unit. Um, this is reflected in, in a number of policy changes and I list a lot of these policies and describe them in my book, uh, which is, as, as uh, Roy mentioned, uh, open access, so you're more, more than welcome to, um, uh, to take a look. I'm actually going to possibly put the, the link to, um, to the site from which you can download it into, into the chat. But let me just mention a few things. In the new constitution of 2012 and in the, in the new child protection law, the Orban government established the family as the basic unit of society which best represents the vitality of the nation. A long slew of policies and regulation followed to reflect this. So, for example, in 2014, um, the government reintroduced the family, the tax, a tax rebate. This is like an earned income tax credit to parents with children. It, could, it can only be came, claimed by parents who are working in the formal labor market. This is not trivial. A lot of people work in the informal labor market who are excluded. So it's not enough to be working. You have to be working in the right place. You have to have an income from a right place. And the more money you make, um, the more of the benefit you can claim. And a few years later, a few years following uh, uh, the tax rebate, the government passed the most extensive pronatalist policy uh, ever seen in Europe often referred to as, um, as a family protection measure. Most of the benefits, and there are many, too, way too many to list here, all these loans and subsidies um, can be claimed or can be fully claimed, claimed to, to, the, to its full extent by families as defined as heterosexual married couples with children. Sometimes marriage is a requirement, sometimes it's not. Um, but certainly having children is a requirement, working for wages is a requirement, and living in, in um, a heterosexual union is often needed because two incomes are needed to claim the benefits. Now, it is, I mean, it is important to note that this definition excludes, obviously, a vast number of parents, too, and children or individual citizens who live outside of this narrowly defined arrangement. And most people are, of course, aware of this exclusion. Yet, the aspirational power of the idealized family is so strong um, that, that you, they sort of forget about the exclusion, or at least this exclusion does not turn into a political liability for, for the government. Obviously, uh, the, 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 these uh, um, um, state, uh, family protection measures are buttressed by ongoing uh, government uh, propaganda. As de they're depicted on giant posters. You've seen one example of this, so that helps. Um, but still, there's something very um, important. Uh, people do find the, the, the family, uh, uh, the, the concept of the family, really very important. So it is widely considered, so, this, so all of these policies, regardless of the exclusion, are widely considered legitimate. Um, and it is considered legitimate that families, rather than individuals, or as it understates socialism, social groups of some kind, or perhaps um, uh, migrants as a social group of migrants should be the subject of policymaking, and 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 should be and and that status should be the the the, the basis for citizenship claims. The family so defined has served to assure political legitimacy to the Orban government, and also assured repeated overwhelming electoral success. Um, this is actually, so the, 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 the family policies and the concept of the family and, and em emphasizing the concept of the family has, uh, has brought tremendous political gain to this government. 
Now, what constitutes a family is strictly regulated in the Hungarian constitution. And in one of the previous slides, you've seen a few quotes. Um, so recent policies protect the right of the state to mark individuals' gender permanently at birth and thus destine them to specific roles within the family. Now, I'm pointing this out uh, because um, this is particularly consequential since unlike in many liberal democracies of the 21st century, or even the state socialist societies of the past, equality between men and women is not considered a value, is explicitly openly not considered a positive value, even at the level of ideology or discourse. Instead, so instead of the need of societal level gender equality, women's well being is to be embedded in their role as intensively reproductive members of the family. Outside of it, they do not exist. So to summarize, I argued, I, I want to make the point that, that the Orban regime reached back to the institution of the family, which had been held in high esteem by Hungarians for decades, redefined it to fit its political needs and has been using it more successfully than ever for political uh, gain. And while concern about the family is part of uh, um, anti-gender discourse worldwide, rarely do we see it as a ruling political ideology and as the ideological backbone of policy formation and political hegemony in a country. I do think this is unique. And then let me let me make uh, let, let just one last word, uh, sort of a political uh, political word, not less analytical, more political. I think we should take note of the fact that the political agenda of um, offering the vision of the family, this sort of half imagined, half real community as a sanctuary against the atrocities of the global neoliberal Western capitalist world and George Soros. This is extremely efficient, extremely um, useful politically. So I believe that successful progressive political movements cannot ignore this lesson. Um, they must offer alternatives, which are, of course, more fair and more inclusive and more equitable and possibly altogether different than Orban's vision, but still capture the aspect, that aspect of belonging that is so essential to many people, yet something that's missing from uh, most left-wing uh, leaning and liberal leaning uh, uh, political um, discourse. Thank you. Thank you, for, uh, Professor Fodor. Yes, there we are. Um, let me remind you all again that you may enter your questions into the Q&A window. Um, so uh, please direct your questions to the Q&A window rather than to the chat. Um, and we'll, we'll address these in the Q&A section uh, in the second half. Um, but now I am delighted to uh, welcome our next speaker, Alyssa Klotz. Alyssa Klotz is an assistant professor of history at the University of Pittsburgh. Her work focuses on the intersection of Soviet history, gender history, and the history of aging. Her work has appeared in the Soviet and post-Soviet Review, Critica, and the Paul Grave hand, uh, Handbook on Women and Gender in 20th Century Russia and the Soviet Union. She is currently working on two research projects. The first is a book manuscript titled The Kitchen Maid That Will Rule the State, Domestic Service in the Soviet Union, through archival documents, Soviet press, and works of fiction and film, Professor Klotz analyzes how three groups of actors, domestic workers, their employers, and the state, made sense of paid domestic labor while building socialism. Her second current project is undertaken in collaboration with Maria um, Ramashova at Perm State University. Together, Professor Klotz and Ramashova examine gender and aging under socialism, with a focus on the ways that elderly people in socialist countries experienced old age. Uh, I'll turn now the floor to Professor Klotz. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much for the introduction and for the opportunity to talk. And unlike the previous speaker, I'm not an expert on contemporary developments. Um, I'm a historian, so I will focus on what I've termed uh, the late Soviet roots of Russia's anti-genderism. And even though I'm gonna talk about the Soviet past, it's only appropriate that I will start with a quote from Vladimir Putin. So on February 
2022, Vladimir Putin addressed the nation and the world following Russia's invasion of Ukraine. In his speech, Putin justified the war as a, a response to an existential threat uh, coming from the West. Not only the United States and NATO were have been undermining Russia geopolitically, they, and here I quote, sought to destroy our traditional values and force on us their false values that would erode us, our people from within, the attitudes they have been aggressively imposing on their countries, attitudes that are directly leading to degradation and degeneration because they're contrary to human nature, end quote. Um, this speech is very consistent with Putin's previous statement in which he portrayed Russia as this last bastion of morality and what he calls uh, family values that entail uh, um, patriotism, um, spirituality, collectivism, and also traditional gender roles, roles and heterosexuality. Putin roles are, uh, words are, of course, not just rhetoric. Um, if you've been following the news, then you know that since mid-2000s, Putin have Putin's government have introduced uh, measures that limited access to abortion, made it harder to prosecute domestic abusers, and of course, restricted um, rights of LGBTQ plus individuals. And, uh, Putin's rhetoric is part of this uh, global um, movement that scholars have defined as anti-gender. And even though the roots are historically seen in, in the American far right or Catholic church in Europe, recently Russia has become a very important actor globally. As Kevin Moss has argued, in Russia, anti-gender stance has broad appeal with the state, the Catholic church, but also academics and members of grassroots organizations speaking in one voice, while their opponents remain marginalized. And in my presentation, I want to talk about uh, the Soviet, the effects that the, the role of the Soviet past has uh, played and how it contributed to this contemporary conservative turn. But rather than trying to create a sort of a genealogy of Russian conservatism, I want to um, ask why Russians today are so receptive to anti-gender rhetoric and what the country's Soviet past has to do with it. Um, so far, uh, when Russia's Soviet past does come up in discussions of anti-genderism today, um, the focus is mainly on Stalinism. So the argument goes that uh, during the first decades of Soviet power, the Bolsheviks enacted some very progressive um, legislation. We see legal equality between sexes, decriminalization of abortion, decriminalization of homosexuality, no cause divorces. Uh, but under Stalin in the 1930s, we see a conservative turn. So the divorce becomes more difficult, abortion is recriminalized, homosexuality is uh, um, recriminalized. And we see this kind of the beginning of a Soviet, very aggressive uh, pronatalism. The Stalin era also witnessed a shift uh, in the general conceptualizations of women's role in Soviet society. So if during the first decades of so Soviet power, women's contribution to society was basically measured by her contribution in public sphere, in production and in political life. Under Stalin, uh, women were expected to equally contribute outside the home and in the home and their contribution in the home, especially connected with child rearing were seen as equally important to what they were doing in the factory. Um, so, this, uh, this change in policies were closely tied with anxieties over reproduction that we see in uh, interwar Europe. And this kind of anxieties will remain at the core of Soviet and post-Soviet uh, gender politics. And of course, I agree that the um, Stalinism is very important when we wanna see kind of the roots of this change. But I want to nonetheless draw attention to the post-Stalinist period and argue that a study of the last decades of Soviet power are crucial uh, for making sense of contemporary Russia's anti-genderism. I think such analysis will help us understand why anti-gender rhetoric has such a broad appeal in Russia today. Um, the late Soviet period was a time of a lively discussion of um, 
questions regarding women and the family. The Soviet leadership considered the, the topic of relationship between the sexes as a um, um, relatively safe critique of the system's fixable shortcomings. The Soviet leadership also hoped that in these public discussions, um, th there will be a solution to the country's demographic problem. One problem was, of course, the decline in birth rate that we see since mid 1930s, and the other um, problem was a rapid increase in divorce rates uh, in the post Stalinist era. And these debates about birth rates and divorce rates quickly turned into a wide interrogations of gender roles in Soviet society. Uh, and of course, the traditional approach um, has been um, to encourage women's participation in production. And the proponents of this traditional approach argue that women's participation, even in traditional masculine uh, professions, didn't really ch uh, challenge their femininity. In other words, um, a highly qualified female engineer will still want to get married and have children because this is uh, the motherhood is really the essence of womanhood. Therefore, there is no threat in women's employment, and what needs to be done is more of the same. You know, um, educating uh, young couples about their responsibilities uh, and also building more service facilities to lessen the burden of housework. But in this late Soviet debates, we see a very critical, strong critical voice that comes from Soviet uh, liberal intelligentsia. On the pages of Soviet press, uh, representatives of Soviet liberal intelligentsia uh, decried what they called feminization of men and masculinization of women, which led to broken families, low birth rates, and general unhappiness. So by criticizing the inversion of gender roles, liberal intelligentsia were attacking the foundational principles of the Soviet program of women's emancipation. By forcing women into the areas that were unnatural to them, the party had distorted relationship between the sexes and damaged the family. I suggest that the liberal critique of the inversion of gender roles was a reaction to the women's uh, changing position in the Soviet society. Um, while the Soviet workforce continued to show considerable gender segregation and low access uh, to authority for women, there were several spheres in which gender barriers began to crumble, scientific and technical occupation and management. So in the 1960s, we see a big influx of women in the engineering profession. By the end of the decade, um, the 1960s, almost half of the Soviet engineers are women. A degree of engineering is very important because that is a prerequisite for, for getting ahead in the kind of in the managerial ladder. So because there are more women getting engineering degrees, we see an increase in women enterprise directors. So from uh, say less than 1% of female enterprise directors in 1956 to 13% in 1970, which of course is no, um, uh, gender equality, but it's still a substantial increase in just a decade. Um, women's career advancement undoubtedly put a strain on their ability to perform the household chores that were expected of them. Um, and the issue of balancing and professional family responsibilities figured prominently in the discussions of women's question in late Soviet press. Um, so we see that kind of women's encroachment in the traditional masculine spheres, professional spheres, were accompanied by increased conflict in the home. I think it is reasonable to suppose that it is women's advancement in scientific and technical spheres that triggered this anxieties about gender inversion about educated men. These were the men that staffed the intellectual center when you see a lot of women's advancement. These were also the men that were more likely to be married to educated women. Um, further research is needed um, to really get into how men and women of the intelligentsia made sense of this change, but I think there is evidence that suggests that uh, intelligentsia men were indeed alarmed by women's professional advancement um, 
Um, so, for example, in 1985, a woman's journal, Rabotnitsa, published a letter from a female engineer who celebrated her divorce as a way to emancipate herself from her husband, who didn't appreciate her commitment to being a professional woman. And um, a list of responses included many uh, criticizing Elena, for example, a man from Donetsk wrote, emancipation has come too far. Isn't it time to stop? Only egoistic women, according to him, chose the easy path of professional success over the less glamorous but more important role of taking care of the family. These negative uh, attitudes towards women's professional advancement were often um, shared not only by other intelligentsia men, but also women. Um, some women would express this gender bias against professionally um, uh, pro um, professionally successful women um, kind of uh, in order to reinstate the own femininity in a society that was suspicious of women's leadership. Other men, uh, women uh, expressed their dissatisfaction with the fact that the state expected them to balance the, uh, their professional responsibilities and their responsibilities in the home without uh, providing them the public services they promised or encouraging their husbands and um, other male members of the family to share responsibilities in the home. So the debates about gender roles on the pages of the Soviet press prominently featured intelligentsia men and women. Such publication probably had a wider readership beyond the class of educated urbanites, but I think most importantly, the late Soviet cinema has really popularized the notion that women's professional success is detrimental to the family. If any of you are familiar with late Soviet hits such as Moscow Does Not Believe in Tears or The Office Romance, you know what I'm talking about. So I hypothesize that the liberal attacks on gender equality fed into the popular gender bias of the Soviet population. This particular kind of liberal critique in fa fact became the foundation of the new vision um, of the Soviet approach to the women's question articulated during Perestroika by Mikhail Gorbachev, who famously called for women's return to their purely women's mission. And this I see as a direct continuation of this um, late Soviet liberal critique. Now, I just want to make a caveat that, of course, this kind of conservatism was not unique to the Soviet Union. It existed in other places in the world. But what was de definitely particular, if we compare the Soviet Union and, say, countries in the capitalist West, that the Soviet Union did not have a mass feminist or a mass LGBTQ plus movement to challenge uh, these traditional um, ideas about gender and, um, and sexuality. Um, the collapse of the Soviet Union created opportunities to challenge this conservative use of gender equalities, but they were not successful. The overall vision of the country's new leadership was to a great extent rooted in the late Soviet liberal strain of thought, including its focus on women's natural roles as mothers and wives. So the 1990s discourse, of course, um, um, kind of um, um, uh, spilled into the early Putin years. It is difficult to measure a popular response to publication in the press and the political statements, yet evidence suggests that the gendered worldview was shared by many Russians. Um, I just want to conclude by emphasizing that uh, Russians can um, differ on how they relate to the Soviet past. They can be members of the liberal intelligentsia, very critical of, of um, the Soviet system, yet uh, they can be very nostalgic, but, um, regardless of their relationship to the Soviet regime, they, what they share is that this essentialist uh, view on gender roles, just like in the late Soviet debates about women in the family, both the proponents and the opponents of women's emancipation Soviet style assume the differences between men and women were biologically determined. And this shared belief in foundational differences between the sexes and women's unique role in reproducing the nation made broad segments of the Russian society receptive to the notion of traditional family values. So even though the Soviet past did not, of course, uh, directly cause Russian's term of to anti-genderism, I think the late Soviet debates laid the groundwork for the contemporary conservative consensus in Russia. Thank you.
Thank you, Professor Klotz. Uh, our next speaker is Elzbieta Korolchuk. Elzbieta Korolchuk is an associate professor of sociology at Södertörn University in Sweden and at the American Studies Center at the University of Warsaw. In addition to her academic work, she is an activist and frequent commentator on human rights and women's rights. Professor Korolchuk has conducted research on civil society and social movements, parental activism, and the social and legal implications of assisted reproduction in Poland, as well as conservative mobilization, targeting gender equality and feminism. A partial list of her most recent publications includes Rebellious Parents, Parental Movements in Central Eastern Europe and Russia, co-edited with Katalin Fabian, published in 2017, and Civil Society Revisited, Lessons from Poland, co-edited with Kirsten Jakobsen, and published in 2017. In 2021, with Agnieszka Graf, she published the monograph, Anti-Gender Politics and the Populist Moment, which analyzes how opposition to the concept of gender has, since 2010, come to act as a key component in right-wing populist politics and discourses. Professor Korolchuk is a member of numerous research networks on gender politics in Europe, uh, as just one example, um, a project led by Jenny Gunnarsson Payne titled Reproducing Injustice Towards a Relational Theory of Reproductive Justice of Surrogacy in Baltic, Central, and Eastern Europe. So with that, I will turn it over to Professor Korolchuk. Thank you very much for invitation and thank you very much for uh, this uh, wonderful discussion. And uh, how my speech will be based on the book just mentioned, uh, Anti-Gender Politics in a Populist mom moment, uh, moment, which uh, we um, co-authored together with Agnieszka Graf. And uh, I would like to focus on um, the question, why now? basically, because obviously the trends that we are observing are not new, because if we look at who's at the core of anti-gender campaigns, uh, we will see um, quite a lot of the usual suspects, right? We, we will see the religious fundamentalists of different creeds, uh, um, Catholic, evangelicals, Orthodox, and so on. We will see um, transnational networks, some of which have a root in the 90s, such as World Congress of Families, which are the, originated in the US uh, with the help and with, in cooperation with uh, Russian uh, actors as well. Um, organizations such as TFP, which originated in the 60s in Brazil, connecting this kind of neoliberal stance with uh, 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 religious fundamentalist. For fundamentalism will also have some new actors such as Citizen Go, uh, an open platform established in Hungary, sorry, in Spain this time uh, in 2013, which um, mobilizes people in now, I think, over 30 countries around the globe. Uh, and we will also have um, secular national organizations in Poland, the most, probably the most visible is Ordo Juris Institute, which has become very vocal uh, on issues connected to uh, abortion and also LGBTQ rights. Um, but um, um, the issues that they work on, such as opposition to reproductive rights, uh, sex education, LGBTQ rights, especially trans rights, um, a measure, uh, equality measures such as Istanbul Convention are not new in a sense, right? We, we know them from quite a while. And of course, we can discern their roots in uh, culture war wars of the 80s and 90s in the United States and the broader conflicts uh, over modernity in many different countries. Uh, but at the same time, we can um, uh, really, I think, agree on the fact that this is a new wave of opposition to both gender theory and the very concept of gender as socially constructed and fluid, and also specific types of rights in specific countries. Uh, and also we can see how money is flooding towards this kind of uh, campaigns because the latest report by Neil Data published uh, last year, uh, it's called the uh, tip of the iceberg. It's available online, so you can check it out. Shows that between 2009 and 2019, um, only in within the European Union, over $7 million has been spent on anti-gender campaigns. And out of that, 1 million 88, 188 million were spent by Russian donors, such as Malafiev and Yakunin's foundation. So there's quite a lot of 
money involved. But again, this money is probably not something new because of course, if we think about the globalization of ideas and the ways in which they, they sort of travel across uh, borders, uh, they, they have always uh, traveled to some extent. What, so my point is uh, that um, anti-gender campaigns should be regarded as a political phenomenon, which reflects an increased level of uh, cooperation, both, uh, both organizational, but also ideological and discursive convergence uh, between ultra-conservative uh, actors uh, and religious fundamentalists on the one hand, and right-wing populists on the other hand. And also it has its own, within Europe especially, but I think there are different sort of configurations around the globe. Um, it reflects uh, the imagined new moral geography of Europe in which broadly defined the East, uh, the post-Soviet, the Central Eastern Europe um, is imagined as the savior of the West. So the repository of uh, the moral virtues, which has been forgotten and uh, and lost by the West because of uh, the progressive movement, because of the 69 and so on. Um, so I would like to focus on this question. Well, so what is this relation between, uh, let's say, anti-gender forces and, um, and uh, right-wing populists uh, rests on? How can we disentangle it? How can we conceptualize it? Um, and for that matter, I'm, I'm thinking about the definition of populism proposed, for example, by Kasmuda and others, uh, which looks at populism as a, a thin centered ideology, which often links itself, sort of becomes thickened through connection to other ideological, more robust ideological, ideological projects. But it also thinks of populism as a form of, of affective politics, uh, which refers not only to the form of rhetoric, but also to its content, especially its ability to, um, uh, to um, promote fear and to, um, and to in a way, um, um, create certain groups as the possible villains within the, the, the public discourse. Because, um, and it's quite interesting because if we look at uh, the literature about uh, populism, and try to discern what is the relation between populism and gender, we don't really have that much there. Um, some scholars, Kasmude himself, a couple of years ago have published an article saying that wait, basically there is no relation between the two, but there are also quite um, a lot of studies which look both at the sort of supply side of uh, populism saying that, you know, charismatic re le leaders are often uh, this kind of strong masculine uh, personas, or on the demand side, uh, saying that gender gap in voting in populist parties uh, shows a certain difference in preferences. Um, but the thing is that, well, we, if we look at uh, Jaroslav Kaczynski, he is far from being a charismatic leader. And if we look at uh, the closing gap uh, in voting patterns, we also can see that this is not an explanation that will um, um, give us a full answer. Um, so I think it's more interesting to look actually at the, uh, the ways in which um, scholars who look at the anti-gender campaigns have tackled the matter. And uh, for example, Dietze and Roth has shown that um, the populists often, use, especially right-wing populists, but also right-wing extremists, uh, extremists uh, use gender as a way to sanitize their um, um, elements of their discourse, especially more uh, sort of less palatable ones, such as Islamophobia or open racism. Uh, and also um, um, Roth has, pushed, has put attention, uh, call attention to patterns of engendering, showing that um, um, there is, a, for example, pattern for gendering social inequalities through ethnosexism. And this, I think, also connects to what Eva Fodor was talking about. Um, and also, uh, for example, Birgit Sauer talks about um, right-wing populism as a project of masculinist identity politics, right? So uh, it's not only about um, um, the roles of different genders, but it's also about affective patterns, and it's also about 
um, uh, masculinization of the opposition to commodification of everyday lives. Um, and uh, of course, there are also uh, there are also uh, um, scholars uh, such as, for example, Andrea Petro and Veronica Grzebowska, who talks about the general uh, connection between neoliberalism and the ways in which right wing populists uh, propose a certain way to uh, a certain way out of it. Uh, and the ways in which they use gender uh, sort of to culturalize political differences. I would like to propose the notion of uh, opportunistic synergy between anti-gender uh, actors and, uh, uh, and right-wing populists. And this is, I think, something that um, uh, develops differently in different contexts. And it's quite interesting. I'm thinking especially about Hungary now because um, this is the uh, country where you don't really have a strong um, um, anti-gender movement, but you have, uh, as, uh, as Eva Fodor has said, um, anti-gender political regime. Uh, the Polish context, I would say, is a context in which you have both. You have quite strong or actually very strong anti-gender movement uh, consisting both of the fundamentalist part of the Catholic Church and uh, civil society organizations. And you can also see gradual thickening of this right-wing populist project uh, that is uh, being developed and implemented by uh, a right-wing coalition, which is in power now, through adopting um, elements of anti-gender discourse. From the beginning, it was the gender ideology that was posed as the main threat. And around 2018, 2020, it was the LGBT uh, ideology that sort of replaced it. Uh, so what is this opportunistic <clears throat> synergy about? Um, I think that we can define it as a dynamic that is both ideological, <coughs> sorry, discursive, and also strategic and organizational. And of course, it's quite easy to point out what the civil society actors and religious fundamentalists gain from it, right? They gain legitimacy, voice in the public sphere in countries where right-wing populists are in power, such as Poland, for example. They gain access to uh, quite substantial resources, uh, access to the corridors of power. Other European Institute um, representatives have become uh, parts of, for example, uh, committees, certain committees. They have been the advisors of the uh, ministers. They have been the people who uh, managed to enter, for example, the Constitutional Tribunal and Polish highest court, uh, but they also gain secular credibility. So they no longer uh, appear as those who, uh, who are connected to religious authorities, but they have, um, they through this uh, connection, they strengthen their, uh, for example, think tank um, um, uh, appeal. Uh, but what is also important is the question, what is the, um, the um, need or the gain of the right-wing uh, populist part of this equation? Uh, and I think that on the one hand, this, uh, this uh, adoption, this increasing adoption, as in the Polish case, of anti-gender discourse and also policy goals, strengthened the ideological coherence of populism by helping to both continuously define or redefine who the elites and the people are, but also moralize this divide, right? So the, uh, the elites are always cunning, uh, degenerate, but also it allows to uh, present minority groups such as feminists or LGBTQ people as connected to global liberal elites and therefore powerful, insidious and corrupted. And of course, the people are always imagined, are imagined within this uh, within this uh, discourse as um, uh, socially conservative, locally rooted, authentic, and uh, always in need of being saved from cultural colonization. And of course, this is part of the affective politics of, um, of right-wing populism, in which, um, uh, in which uh, the political uh, divisions become uh, a version of this Manichaean Polit uh, uh, sort of struggle between uh, good and evil. And of course, this is also the moment where this connection between uh, this discourse of traditional family and binary gender roles meets welfare chauvinist pro-family policies, which allow to broaden uh, voters' base, but also make this um, uh, uh, political proposal uh, much more coherent, 
in the sense that it connects the cultural with the uh, economic. So just to um, uh, finish up uh, this, um, this uh, presentation, I think that this uh, connection has been enabled by three trends. On the one hand, we know from different contexts, also the US context, that there is a growing secularization of the, um, of the language, the discourse of uh, ultra-conservative religious fundamentalist groups. Um, so they no longer talk about the hells of fire, at least some of them of course are, but uh, they uh, uh, effectively take over the, the language of rights and protection of minorities. The second is, as I said, the framing of uh, critiques, these ultra-conservative uh, critiques of gender in populist terms. So in a way, it's already a, red, it's, it's a ready-made uh, populist uh, version uh, of uh, the divisions within the society. And finally, and this I think it's especially um, visible in uh, Central Eastern Europe and post-Soviet uh, context, uh, what works is the presentation or uh, uh, positioning of, uh, of these anti-gender campaigns as a sort of uh, opposition to neoliberal social cultural formation. And I think in the countries uh, such as Poland and, and uh, uh, Hungary, for example, which has been affected by, uh, by the free market democracy model in which, uh, in which uh, democratization has been very much linked with um, austerity measures and neoliberal um, policies, uh, this vision of traditional family and support from the state for the families uh, as a refuge from alienation and rampant individual, uh, individualism of the current of the modern world uh, really works uh, for certain segments of the, of the population and becomes really attractive vision of how the society should work. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Professor Korolchuk. Uh, and finally, we are delighted to welcome our last presenter, Jill Messino. Uh, Jill Messino is an associate professor of history and a scholar of Romanian and gender studies at University of North Carolina, Charlotte. With Shauna Penn, Professor Messino co-edited the volume Gender Politics in Everyday Life in State Socialist Eastern and Central Europe, which was published in 2009. In 2019, she published a monograph titled Ambiguous Transitions, Gender, the State, and Everyday Life in Socialist and Post-Socialist Romania. Professor Messino is an author of many chapters and articles. Uh, her work has appeared, among others, in the journals Aspasia and the Journal of Women's History, as well as in the edited volume, The Routledge International Handbook to Gender in Central Eastern Europe and Eurasia. She is currently working on a book project titled Friends in Need, which explores Romania's relationship with a number of countries in the global south during the Cold War. Additionally, Professor Messino is a frequent host on the podcast uh, New Books Network. Um, we encourage you to check out her excellent interviews on that podcast. All right, I'll turn it over to Professor Messino. Thanks so much for inviting me to take part in this exciting series, uh, Misha and Roy. And it's really an honor to be among such esteemed scholars and activists. And uh, right now they just decided to uh, collect the trash outside of this hotel. So hopefully it won't be too loud. Uh, and you'll, you'll, it won't be too distracting for you. Um, so in the brief time I have today, um, I'm just gonna discuss some of the ways in which anti-gender and anti-LGBTQ movements in Romania have attempted to undermine the rights and freedoms uh, of women and sexual minorities. Um, and you know, I'm, my main argument is while these are concerning, uh, in Romania, these movements have been generally less successful than their Polish, Hungarian, and Russian counterparts. And certainly Romania has experienced some uh, populist, uh, black, uh, well, democratic backsliding, as well as kind of move towards populism. Um, and that was evident in efforts, efforts to tamper with the judiciary and also um, revise laws on corruption. Populism really hasn't taken root in Romania to the same degree as it is in Hungary. Um, and so even though there's been efforts to, to ban gender as a uh, subject in, of instruction and intellectual inquiry, it hasn't really you know, taken root, it hasn't passed in Romania. And even despite the Orthodox Church's privileged position in Romania, um, neither it nor those who promote 
conservative uh, gender uh, policies and agendas have secured uh, sufficient uh, support in the legislative realm. Um, so abortion continues to be legal in Romania um, and church leaders don't use the anniversary of a major event such as the commemoration of the Warsaw Uprising to denounce homosexuality as a foreign ideology uh, as has been the case in Poland. So of course we don't know what remains to be seen in the future. So I'm going to talk about anti-genderism in the, uh, the first part and then talk about anti-LGBTQ efforts. Um, and my focus on anti-genderism is going to be primarily on um, reproductive rights, uh, uh, efforts to undermine reproductive rights. And um, it, most policymakers are, are generally shy away with from tampering with reproductive rights, right, given the horrific legacy of Nikolai Ceausescu's draconian uh, pronatalist policy. So there really hasn't been uh, effective means uh, to tamper with them, at least legislatively. Um, so really, the efforts have been more insidious, um, more de facto in character. Uh, so abortion is legal in Romania. It's been legal since the collapse uh, of communism. It was one of the first legislative initiatives, the decriminalization of abortion. It's illegal on demand uh, up to 14 weeks of pregnancy. Um, and uh, this, of course, resulted in a dramatic increase in the abortion rate during the 1990s, the early 90s uh, in Romania. Uh, but this occurred alongside uh, the establishment of family planning centers uh, in Romania, which were funded by the World Bank, uh, the U.S. government, the International uh, Planned Parenthood Federation. Um, and these plan family planning uh, initiatives um, uh, provided subsidies uh, for contraception. So uh, 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 family planning centers were established. They helped to train doctors, but also they had counseling centers for individuals in rural and urban areas. And they also subsidized contraception, particularly to at-risk groups um, and low-income women, uh, unemployed women, as well as students. So this was a really important means of also uh, controlling fertility so women didn't have to resort to abortion. Uh, at the same time this occurred, however, to be uh, exact, in 1990, uh, the anti-choice uh, Christian organization Pro Vita, Pro-Life, uh, was founded uh, in Romania. And it offered counseling uh, services to women and teens that were pregnant. Um, and it has since then organized marches for life in Romania in various cities um, in which abortion is condemned and uh, adoption is basically presented as uh, the noble choice. And what's interesting about Provita is they instrumentalize the communist past, as do other, uh, other elites in the, in, the, in the country, in Romania. But um, they do so in a way that doesn't wholly condemn communism. So um, they, they point to the fact that, isn't it ironic that under the dictatorship of Nicolae Ceausescu, um, there was greater reverence for the unborn than in uh, the liberal democratic uh, uh, Romania, right? Than under the leadership uh, of liberal democratic uh, uh, governments. So um, that, that, that tolerate essentially the killing of children. So it's really interesting how they use the past but instrumentalize it in a particular way. Um, and Pro Vita, along with the churches, so the Orthodox Church, the Catholic Church, the Evangelical Church, support a total ban on abortion, and they also promote chastity uh, and argue that the high abortion rate uh, is the result of promiscuity. Uh, well, it's not probably a surprise to you that it, along the same lines, they also uh, condemn sexual education, the teaching of sex, sex, ed, sex ed in schools. And along with some parental associations, um, they recently um, uh, protested uh, a law that had been approved by the Romanian parliament, uh, but then was ultimately scrapped, which would have mandated uh, sex ed in schools. So this law was introduced in 2020. So it's uh, not, not mandated. Sex ed is not mandated in schools. Um, in Romania. And the argument, of course, was that it was a threat to children's innocence and their virtue. Um, and it should, of course, then no, come as no surprise that Romania among, ranks among the highest in the EU uh, with regard to teen pregnancy rates, uh, as well as the lack of information about fertility control and certainly uh, sexually uh, transmitted uh, diseases and such. Um, so as I noted, efforts to restrict abortion have been insidious, um, and one example of this uh, was uh, the draft law on the establishment, uh, operation, and organization of centers uh, for pregnancy crisis counseling. And this was uh, proposed to the parliament, uh, the reigning parliament, by conservative politicians in 2012, and it mandated that women who were seeking an abortion attend uh, counseling, they view stills, uh, a video clips of an abortion being performed, and undergo a five a period of self-reflection, so essentially a waiting period. Uh, thankfully, there was a lot of mobilization around this, uh, this, this legislative initiative, so feminists and other NGOs protested it. 
arguing that it undermined women's uh, legal right to privacy, their health and their autonomy, and it failed to pass. Uh, but a worrisome trend uh, uh, has continued to occur since around this time, since the early 2000s, and that is doctors and, and public hospitals have increasingly refused to perform abortion uh, on religious or moral grounds. Um, and uh, often privately performed abortions are cost prohibitive, right? And especially for low income or unemployed or rural uh, women. Um, and uh, of course, alongside all of this, there has been um, cutbacks in um, subsidies to these fertility centers or these family planning centers that I uh, uh, mentioned earlier. So with EU accession in 2007, uh, many of these organizations that had funded these family planning centers withdrew the funds uh, in the anticipation that the EU would uh, fund them instead. Well, that didn't happen. And these centers were only kind of uh, not, not necessarily consistently funded by uh, the Romanian Ministry of Health. So uh, some of these uh, groups that had been, uh, be, been able to enjoy uh, free contraception, so such as, uh, as I said, uh, unemployed, uh, low income uh, women and students no longer could do that. And so alongside you have uh, the, in the increasing refusal of public doctors to perform these abortions, uh, you have then uh, decreased uh, access to, uh, to contraception, uh, to subsidized contraception. And certainly private uh, abortion is cost prohibitive uh, for many. And so you know, it's not surprising, again, in this context that, you know, you see uh, increased rates of abortion. Um, but what's also particularly tragic is you see kind of a return to some of the practices that um, that women engaged in in the late 60s, 70s and 80s to control their fertility. Right. So trying to uh, self-induce an abortion or going to um, an abortion provider that isn't necessarily trained in that. Um, and there have already been some deaths as a result of this. Uh, some women have also resorted to committing su suicide. So one woman in 2017, a young uh, pregnant woman who already three children, uh, jumped in front of a train with her with her children because she had been unsuccessful in self-aborting and she couldn't afford a private abortion and she didn't know what to do. So this is this is one of the uh, really unfortunate uh, ways in which Romania seems to be going backwards um, and nothing that would have been anticipated given uh, what we know about the draconian uh, effects uh, of the reproductive policies under Ceausescu. Um, in addition to the fact that uh, women's reproductive freedom has been uh, under threat, gender itself uh, has been under attack. So in June of 2020, uh, the Romanian parliament adopted a law to prohibit the teaching of gender or theories about gender in all educational institutions. Um, and the law was introduced by the Popular Movement Party, uh, which, uh, like Fides and the Law and Justice Party uh, in Poland, referred to gender as an ideology and as its foreign import, uh, anti-national, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and it was preceded by a massive disinformation campaign uh, with the overarching message, and this is probably not going to surprise you, that gender causes, uh, gender teaching gender in school causes children to whimsically change their sexual identity. Um, in response, uh, a number of Romanian academics uh, authored uh, an amicus uh, curiae, uh, uh, which was um, also endorsed by Romanian and foreign universities, uh, as well as a whole host of feminists globally uh, and women activists, uh, women's rights activists and gender activists. Uh, and they submitted that to the Romanian Constitutional Court. Um, and they argued that the proposed amendment was not only unconstitutional and undemocratic, but it would undermine uh, academic freedom, freedom of speech, that it went against uh, the Romanian uh, constitution as well as the European Convention on Human Rights, the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, as well as the Istanbul Convention. So thankfully, um, the Romanian Constitutional Court uh, declared the law unconstitutional and it was scrapped. Um, okay, so I'm gonna transition to talking about anti-LGBTQ efforts uh, just briefly before I sum up. So uh, Romania was a latecomer in terms of the uh, decriminalization of homosexuality. So it was criminalized under Nicolae Ceausescu in 1968 uh, in line with the reproductive policies uh, that were introduced uh, in 1966. So the criminalization of abortion. Um, and in uh, 2001, uh, as part of a conditionality for EU accession, uh, homosexuality was uh, decriminalized. 
Um, and since then, there has been a, a lot of uh, activity and activism uh, designed uh, to raise awareness. Uh, so the first gay pride parade took uh, place in Romania in 2004, and that happens annually. Um, and there are a number of NGOs that are involved in awareness raising and advocating for LGBTQ uh, rights and individuals. Um, and uh, educating the public more generally about non-heteronormative non uh, sexual identities and orientations. Um, but yet same-sex marriage remains uh, illegal uh, in, uh, in Romania. And of course it's condemned by the Orthodox Church. And um, uh, homosexuals and sexual minorities in general experience stigma. They're the objects of both discursive uh, and uh, actual physical violence including by uh, the ultra-nationalist uh, right-wing group uh, Noah Drepta, uh, which often attends these uh, attends the gay pride rallies um, and uh, engages in aggressive, sometimes abusive behavior. So it's not as if uh, there are, the entire country has created safe spaces uh, for sexual minorities. Um, but I would argue at the same time, this is not necessarily reflective of popular sentiment. So I would not argue that homophobia is a general characteristic of Romanians that, 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 that they necessarily identify with these homophobic, homophobic and anti-LGBTQ uh, practices. Um, and this was evident in um, a referendum in 2018, the low voter turnout in response to the referendum. Uh, and the referendum was um, uh, based on changing Article 48 of the Romanian Constitution to specify that marriage can only be between a man and a woman. Um, and the referendum was the product of uh, a, a, the coalition of for the family, which um, no longer really exists, but it was it was a collection of anti-choice and anti-LGBTQ groups. Um, and it was supported by the referendum was actually supported by the Social Democratic Party, which is kind of leftist in its redistributionist efforts, but is socially conservative. Um, ultimate, and of course, by the church, it was uh, this 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 uh, referendum was supported. Uh, it only attracted uh, a little over twenty percent uh, of the electorate, and uh, it was declared null and void. Um, and so, I think this this demonstrates that a significant segment of the population um, is at least somewhat open to same sex marriage, or at least that the possibility should not be foreclosed uh, to individuals indefinitely, or that it's just not a concern to them in general. That it's not worth their time to go out and vote about it. Um, and there was some really, there was an interesting campaign surrounding it too. Some of the uh, commercials were, were pretty savvy uh, against it, uh, encouraging people not to go out and vote for it. Um, of course, nonetheless, conservatives still rail against uh, the, you know, the dangers uh, involved in integrating um, LGBTQ uh, topics and such into the, gen in, into the school curriculum. Um, and recently the Romanian Senate adopted a law. So recently as in the end of uh, April, uh, proposed by the Democratic Alliance of Hungarians uh, on the protection and promotion of the rights of the child. Um, and it, it's intended to prohibit the dissemination and any type of content of deviations from the, the sex established at birth and the popularization of sex change and homosexuality. And so that is, it remains to be seen uh, if that will pass. I, I don't think it will. Um, and I, I think it's important to kind of consider this alongside some of the surveys that have been conducted. So in a 2019 Eurobarometer survey question that asked uh, what uh, school lessons on diversity uh, should be considered, should be included, um, 40 percent of Romanians polled totally agreed that sexual orientation should be included, 45 percent totally agreed that intersex should be included, and 43 percent totally agreed that transgender should be included. So I know these numbers might seem low, but it's not as if there's overwhelming support, right, for uh, a total ban on, on, on teaching this. And again, sex ed is not mandatory in Romania right now, so it's also somewhat related to that. Uh, the EU averages for that, by the way, the EU 28 average for those uh, those questions were 71%, 65 and 65 uh, respectively. Uh, so just to sum up, um, the anti-gender movement and anti-LGBTQ movement uh, in Romania, like those in Hungary and Poland, depict gender identities and alternative sexual orientations and sexual minorities in general as ideologies, right? Uh, that go against nature, that go against the nation, that pervert youth. Um, but in the case of Romania, I would argue that the fact that that 
individuals have not voted in favor of some of the legislative initiatives introduced by uh, these politicians and those who have been at the forefront of these movements uh, are evidence that there hasn't been significant back, democratic backsliding, right? If we're gonna look at democracy very holistically in terms of rights for everyone. Um, and they're not a reflection of popular attitudes. Um, instead, I would argue that their reactions to the politics of inclusivity and increased visibility and legitimacy of gender as a concept, as an identity, and as an area of study. And they also uh, reflect a response to the increased visibility and acceptance of non-heteronormative identities, practices, and orientations in Romania. So I, I think what's important to acknowledge here is that these reactions are also indicative of the progress that has been made. Um, and um, that we need to also alongside that acknowledge that because uh, mobilization around these issues in Romania is still quite, quite, quite prominent and quite active. So uh, feminist mobilization, mobilization for sexual minorities, et cetera, uh, they have done quite a lot of work and, 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 and their, their efforts are really indicative of the progress that has happened uh, in the country since the collapse of, of state socialism. And um, you know, we need to also acknowledge the role of individuals that join in these protests that take part of them. Uh, of course, these movements that I've discussed still represent a threat to the civil rights of women uh, and sexual minorities and to the viability of democracy. So uh, it's beholden on, uh, on the political institutions, but also on individuals and organizations to contest anti-gender and anti-LGBTQ efforts and ensure that all individuals enjoy civil and human rights to prevent uh, further democratic backsliding. And that's it. I hope I stayed within time. Uh, thank you uh, very much, Professor Messino, uh, and thanks to all of our pre uh, presenters today for their brilliant presentations. Um, I can't think of a better way to open up this workshop series. Um, I'll now turn it over to uh, Professor Gao. Um, I hope you can forgive me for a somewhat abbreviated uh, introduction um, for the sake of time. Um, I'll just mention here that uh, Susan Gao is the uh, May and Sydney G. Metzl Distinguished Service Professor of Anthropology, Linguistics, and of the Social Sciences in the College at the University of Chicago. Uh, she recently served as the Director of the Center for Eastern European, uh, Russian, and Eurasian Studies at the University. Uh, with that, I'll turn it over uh, to Professor Gao. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. No, that's great. Very appropriate to have it um, uh, short. Thank you very much for the introduction. Thank you to all of you for your fascinating reports and enlightened, uh, enlightening um, analyses. And thanks to the organizers, of course, Misha and Roy, and for inviting me. Now, this workshop is all too appropriate in its moment for the current US, US um, issue about reproductive uh, rights, the legality of abortion, and actually about contraception as well. It's about to be destroyed by far-right majority on the Supreme Court against the overwhelming support for such rights by the population at large. So in the US, I want to make sure you re-emphasize the US belongs among the countries that should be in our purview if not under the term anti-gender, simply because that's not the form of the discourse, but the same things are happening. <clears throat> and I have to say that I appreciate in particular all four discussions, which are concerned both with state policies and uptake and the, the responses of populations to what's happening um, in, uh, in national politics. I think that is not always the case in analyses, and this is a really, uh, really good thing. So my job here is simply to, um, to raise some issues that we could discuss uh, either now or with the, uh, with the uh, questions that the audience raised, um, and um, we can do it uh, later as well. But I wanted to contribute one scene from Hungary in 2018 18, when Viktor Orban banned the teaching of gender studies in Hungary. There was a roundtable discussion on one of the government-owned TV stations that I was able to tune in on. The lineup was two guys on one side, men, all men, two minds on one side from, a, from, a, from the social science departments of Budapest universities. And on the other side, there were two guys who were who I would call them uh, cadres of the government, one from a, a government-owned website, another one from a government ministry. And the, the uh, people who, on, uh, who were supporting gender studies, who were on the 
the academic side were very restrained. Um, all they said was that gender studies is a standard legitimate um, subject everywhere accepted around the world, um, the, that the scholars in gender studies were mostly theorists. And if they're policy oriented, we're just lobbying for fairness and equality between men and women. Well, the government cadres laughed out loud. It was quite amazing to me. This is not a value, they said. It's not an ideal. There is no equality in society. It is not natural. It is radical, false, and dangerous. There is no money to support such things in Hungary. So I was naive. I was not expecting such a frontal assault on this particular liberal value. It was really a shock to me. So I want to tell, uh, to underline what you have all said, which is that this is not about entirely about gender relations. This is really uh, the, 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 the uh, movements that we're talking about are really about a major attempt at change in social values, governing elites, and in the image of the future and of modernity, what modernity actually means. And of course, those of us working on gender have been arguing for a very long time that gender is at the center of social change. And now we have our, 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 our um, political adversaries doing the very same thing in a very practical way. And let me also very briefly remind us, because it was implied in all of your discussions, but let me remind us of the ironic transformation that have been made in the concept of gender from first meaning species to grammatical categories to an analytic naming an organizational social structural principle in society and a cultural principle metaphorically extendable to classes, countries, policies as ways of justifying power hierarchies. From an academic theories to practical politics has been one move and recently has become an individual and fluid claim to identity not structural principles. And meanwhile, of course, appropriated over a longer term by right-wing theorists for their own purposes. So anti-gender, as several of you have said, anti-LGBTQ is a world phenomenon uh, traceable to the far right, to the US, to Russia, uh, the Catholic Church, of course. It therefore bears the continued and um, uh, returning irony, irony of imitating the West on the one hand, and yet simultaneously setting itself up as the victims of the colonization of the West. I think that's, um, I think that's something we should keep in mind. So here are four questions quickly. So one question is how does post-socialist, how does the past of post-socialism in each of these countries matter? Uh, there are many ways to say this. I think Ava I outlined the, um, the, the three different targets um, in social policy in Hungary. That was very helpful. And moving from, from corporate groups to individuals to families, um, and now the redefinition of family. Um, uh, but I think what I'd like to, and always um, as a response to the ravages of neo-capitalism, but what I'd like to ask you all, if you care to respond, is who are the beneficiaries? Can we name them? They're not going to be any single. But can we name who, either in the countries that you study or across the European continent, who are the beneficiaries? Um, and I, I think that um, Elzbieta talked a lot about the opportunity sy synergy that will help us think about that. A second question is, what difference does it make which organizations and institutions are making anti-gender and anti-LGBTQ plus arguments in the countries that you, that you work in? So does it matter that it's a church? Does it matter that, that they are um, other sorts of organizations? Who are the funders? Um, do people know generally that the funders are often, as Elzbieta said, um, Western, often Russian money? Um, does this matter to anybody? Is it a public uh, fact? Can it be publicized? Third, I was fascinated by the role of intellectuals and the intelligentsia and their specific interests, as Alyssa um, outlined for the, for the late Soviet um, period. Uh, I, I wonder if in each one of your cases, you can think about the role of intellectuals. I, knowing the Hungarian situation best, I have some um, 
some guesses about the intellectual, uh, uh, the, the, um, uh, the input of intellectuals, um, and not necessarily in the same way as the Russian one, but still um, as ones where they were feeling family stresses, they were organizing that family stresses as, um, as a political issue to be, to be uh, spread to a national level. And of course, demographic fears as they came in. And finally, I was really struck by everyone mentioning in one way or another, but I think Elspeth Moore in the book at least, um, the fomenting of fear, threat, and sentimentalization in the making of, uh, I think Ava was the one who talked more about sentimentalization, but it was implied in all of your uh, discussion. Um, uh, as the sentimentalization of double, the double day, which has been around for a very long time, as long as I have been studying gender relations, the double day has been, has been set front and center, but, the, but of sacrifice, of parenthood. Um, as a form of, of, um, of uh, critique of individualism, the loss of masculine privilege and this being made into um, a national um, political issue. And the fact that none of you really mentioned sexuality, I don't mean reproduction, but sex. That is what people do in the, in the privacy of their, of their homes, perhaps sometimes their bedrooms and whether how it is that that's understood by the people who are both making the policies and also um, understanding them. So is this, uh, as a final point, is this a double game that we are, um, that we are um, witnessing? Um, a critique of neoliberal excesses of individualism and a retreat to the family as a haven or the pr proposal that that's what should be done. While at the same time in all of these countries preparing more neoliberal exploitation of at least some workers by the government policies that we are being, or that we are witness to, um, certainly in Hungary, but in other places. So is this a double game? On the one hand, go back to the family, sacrifice yourself, um, that will protect you from exploitation is the implication, right? And on the other hand, have some more ex exploitation because we are um, uh, dealing with um, uh, Western neoliberalism, which is not being stopped. Uh, uh, capitalism, neoliberal capitalism. So thank you very much for extremely fascinating and provocative talks. And perhaps some of these questions will be um, of interest to you, but I'm now going to go look and see what other questions um, have been posed by the people in, uh, in, the, in the question and answer chat. But thank you so much, all of you. It just was um, a real pleasure and wonderful to, uh, to hear your, your analyses. So would you like to take up, would anybody like to take up um, one of the, the, the things that I posed um, uh, as while I, um, while I look for, where are they? Um, ah, okay, here we go. Does anybody in our group, oh, okay, so I call for them. So Ava is first, I think I have her hand up first, and Elspieta is second, so please speak. Thank you. Um yeah, thank you, Susan. These were these are great questions and uh, ones that I, I, I've been thinking of too. I am particularly fascinated by uh, the beneficiary, the question about the beneficiaries. So who's gaining here and uh, why do people feel that they're gaining? This is very obvious in Hungary because the Hungarian government has just been reelected by a, 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 a huge majority again for the fourth time in a row even though you know, a lot of people are actually excluded from these benefits. So it is, and it's just difficult for me to believe that, um, that people are just simply deluded. It's also difficult for me to believe that it's just, um, people tend to vote uh, on economic grounds or at least tend to consider their economic conditions when they vote. So my argument is, in this book, and it's not in the book too, and uh, and I, I still think this is right after this election that happened after I, the book was published. Um, and there's there's not a lot of data to support this, but my sense is that um, with this um, with the type of with, with the anti-gender discourse and the related pronatalism, 
the two are really uh, closely connected and the emphasis on, on on the protection of the family the government is clearly targeting the, um, the, the, the 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 sort of the upper segment of society inequalities in hungary are growing but not only them they're also targeting lower middle class um, people who are in precarious positions, exactly the people who are the, who are the most exploited by neoliberal, uh, uh, sort of a neoliberal uh, exploitation in the labor market. These are people who are working in factories and are working in informal jobs and had never seen in their whole entire lives 10 million Hungarian foreigners, which is what you can get if you promise to have three children. They would, this is the, the kind of money um, I, I calculated in the book, I forgot, but this is several years of, of, of wages for, for, for this, this group of people. And they have access to this money now. So in some sense, they benefit, at least they benefit in the short term. I believe that the government is sort of buying, they, they are the beneficiaries to some extent, at least a short term beneficiary, and the government is in fact buying their votes, not buying like physically buying, but buying their votes in the long run. Now, this is a short term gain because you can take a 10 million um, um, loan, but what if you don't have, this? if you have three children, then the loan is for, forgiven them and you don't have to pay back the money. But what if you get divorced? Then you're in deep trouble. What if you don't have three children because stuff happens and you just can't have three children. Again, you, then you have to pay some of the money back. It's unclear how that would happen. So in the long run, this could, for particularly this extremely vulnerable group of people, this could be hugely problematic. But for the moment, when they're just taking the loans, when they have access to resources and access to, and have the potential and possibilities to buy a home, to build a house, I think this is um, this is a huge gain for uh, for this group as well. Um, it's a different, so it has a different meaning than it does to upper class, like you know myself. I could use any of these benefits, uh, all of it. Um, uh, somehow, interestingly, I am targeted by uh, by these policies and people who make enough money on the formal labor market. But that's we are in a different category than those people at the bottom of, or, or not not quite at the bottom, but a little bit above the bottom of the social hierarchy. I think the fact that these policies are available to them, if to a limited degree as well. Uh, is extremely important and is extremely important economically as well. Thank you. Yeah. Alžbeta? Um, yes, this is actually connected uh, to what Eva was saying, because I, I was thinking about your question, uh, if this is sort of a double um, sort of play, critique of neoliberalism connected with uh, introduction of actual neoliberal policies. And I think yes and no, because I think that in countries such as Poland, we have a sort of hybrid regime today, which on the one hand, uh, really strengthens the exploitation, for example, through weakening labor unions, through uh, through um, making organization of, uh, of workers much more difficult, through, for example, weakening um, uh, state power to actually control the conditions of the labor market and, the, and so on. And also, and the, so in a way, the logic is that the state provides people with the universal money for each child uh, so that for a, a, a huge group of people who uh, make, uh, let's say, not enough money to buy, for example, certain, um, okay, so one, one element added to that, that th this type of investments that they are doing is not the investment in the infrastructure of social services. They do not invest in uh, education. They do not invest in uh, in healthcare, which has been made very clear during the COVID times. Uh, so uh, they, in a way, provide people with the money with this 500 plus slot for each child. So they actually, these people can buy um, uh, their services, for example, extra uh, extra lessons for the children or um, visit at the dentist um, on the market, mm -hmm. right? So some scholars call it second privatization because actually it strengthens the uh, the um, tendency to buy certain services outside of of the state's uh, state uh, system, right? Uh, and on the one hand, um, it actually make people um, well, able to somehow emulate this lifestyle of, uh, uh, you know, middle class people who have been doing it for quite a long time now. And on the other hand, um, I, I think this is important. It's really strengthens the sense that there is a connection, direct connection between the state 
and the people. The, the state sort of gives something to the people, sees them as, uh, as uh, recipients of specific types of money and, um, and, and social provisions. So I think that instead of, if we think about sort of populism model in which we have this kind of strength, strong uh, uh, male um, dominant persona who establishes a direct contact with the people, here we have the idea of the state fully controlled by the uh, uh, right-wing populist party, which establishes direct connection with the people, right? Mm -hmm. So the people become sort of the loyal subjects, not of the nation state, but, but by the, uh, of, the, of the state, which is fully controlled by the party. So I think that this is much more insidious in a way. Yeah, that's really, really interesting. And the nation kind of uh, gets backgrounded from a moment. Uh, I, um, El Alyssa, did you want to respond to my questions or shall I read? Uh, yes, would you like to? Because and th then, then I could read some of the people, some of the ones from, the, from, the, um, uh, from our audience. Can go either way. I can wait for, yeah, I can wait for the questions. Pardon me? I can wait. Okay. I, I can speak later. That's yes. Fine. Okay, good. So we have a question here. What is the role of conservative women in an anti gender politics in CEE, if that's Central East Europe? A rephrase. Um, okay. A couple of participants are asking how we would define. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I lost the. Um, um, how we would define. Uh, anti-liberal and illiberal. For example, if a regime supports what are traditionally and broadly defined as liberties, these are freedom of speech, religion, association, but opposes gay marriage, how would such a regime be defined? Um, a couple of questions are related to law. How do legal systems in the countries of Central and Eastern Europe define biological sex? Do they define any definitions or elaborations of what parent-child relationship means? So this is, this is a question about the people who might be buying into the government policies okay, and what it is that they think that they're buying into. Um, uh, what are the parent-child relationships? What do they mean? Would anybody like to take that on? Or the legal system? I can say something about the parent-child relationship because it is uh, fascinating because again to show how the family is is foregrounded in political discourse the hungarian state um, legislated that children have to take care of their parents so this is now uh, the law <laughs> this is actually very strange if you think about it uh, typically parents have responsibilities towards their children and that's you know enshrined in 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 law but not the other way around so somehow uh, it seems that the government uh, is uh, sort of trying to, do, to, to allow this to, to function in both ways. Again, strengthening the unit of the family. The family, yeah. Actually, but overall, uh, the last, this is the last thought. So parents' rights over children have been increasing everywhere. This is the trend in the sort of children's rights um, uh, on the international scene. Um, and this is... So in some sense, the Hungarian government is sort of following the international um, uh, trend, only sort of taking it to, to, to the extreme. Aha, uh -huh. thank you. So here we have, I think, um, Jill, you have your hand up, but there's also a question here for Romania. So may I read the question and perhaps you might want to answer both the question and your... <laughs> it might be the one that I was gonna ask you to ask, so. <laughs> oh, okay. What are the roots of feminist movements in Romania? Was there any openness to the Western thinkers during the socialist regime? And I'm actually also myself interested in the much more open um, um, uh, social milieu that you have described. So whatever you want to answer, uh, please do. Yeah, I was going to ask the uh, answer the other one, but I can I can comment on that briefly. I mean, uh, you know, Romanians were reading socialist feminists, uh, Simone de Beauvoir, um, and um, but there was no organizing, right? Like independent organizing outside of the state, and you know, gradually the 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 national women's council became really kind of tools of the pronatalist policies and really oriented their policies in that direction so initially promoting literacy and educational efforts and efforts in the workforce and you know was attempting to safeguard women from harassment in the workforce and that and that but gradually as as 
kind of the period, you know, as, as socialism matured, as they say, um, they became really tools. And so they're, they're not as active in terms of engagements um, outside of Romania with other feminists. Um, and, and certainly if they're reading scholars, so I, I know that they were reading Simone de Voir in large part because of women I interviewed in Romania and they talked about reading that, right? The, but that would have been considered acceptable at that time. Um, but certainly uh, feminist mobilization was incredibly um, active. Um, uh, after socialism collapsed. So um, uh, Romania is home to uh, one of the you know, oldest gender studies uh, programs in the region um, and uh, individuals like Mihaly Miroyu and Liliana Popescu and Laura Grunberg, there's the, the mobilization has been incredibly active pretty much uh, since, since the collapse of, of socialism. And certainly, um, you know, in terms of scholarship and research, um, but also in terms of activism and mobilizing uh, around a host of issues. Uh -huh. Right, right. That's very interesting. Um, and, and please, Alyssa, would you like to um, join um, us? Yeah. Yes, thank you. Um, I wanted to um, go back to the questions of parents and children's responsibility. Interestingly enough, in Russia as well, parent, uh, children are responsible for their parents if they become old and not able to support themselves, and if they refuse to support their child, um, their elderly parents, the state can sue them, or maybe perhaps the parents can sue them, and the state can demand kind of alimony to support the parents. So I, I'm not exactly sure where that law and if there's a shared kind of uh, historical um, heritage in those laws because they're both in the post-socialist space. But interestingly enough, I, I mean, I think this whole conversation reminds me of, in a way, like we do have a shared post-Soviet, post-socialist, um, you know, we live in the shared post-socialist world, but Russia is quite different in many ways because it's not a democracy. In, 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 in the most obvious way, because when um, uh, Susan asked the question about why does it matter, you know, who makes those uh, state anti-gender statements in Russia, the only actor that seriously matters is the state. And as um, so Eva pointed out that, uh, okay, we have this global movement towards parental rights. But I feel that in Russia, it's more towards uh, parents, uh, the state rights. If the parents are, you know, we have this whole state system with the state representative, the, the states decide whether a, ch a child can stay with the family, maybe they're abusing or live in unsanitary conditions, or maybe they're gay or trans, and the state has the absolute right to take them away. So I think, uh, it's a it's a very different situation and the same um, is different the relationship with the all those grassroots organizations um, and the church right the state might be enacting some policies that align with their ideas, for example, restricting access to abortion is definitely what uh, the Russian pro pro lifers would have very inspired by the American example demand or what the um, Russian Orthodox Church wants. But I think Putin's leadership being those people um, who grew up in um, the late Soviet society where abortion was reintroduced after Stalin's death because uh, the, consent, the medical consensus was that um, not having a legal abortion actually decreased the number of children because um, back alley abortions cause fertility problems. And Mia Nakachi's recent book, I think, shows this wonderfully. So I think Putin in his um, close, um, the, his government really believed that abortion should not be, be banned. And it doesn't really matter what the grassroots activists or the Russian Orthodox Church says. Thank you for that. <laughs> And, and Jill, would you like to uh, add? Yeah, something? Susan, I was wondering if I could respond to the question in the Q&A about Romania, because it's actually germane to um, my presentation, and I had cut that part out. I was going to address it, but I didn't want to be too speculative. But I, I, think, I think it's interesting, and so um, I, I, I can read it too, or have you found it? No, no, please. Um, have I found it? Um, it's in the Q&A and not in the chat. What are the roots of feminist movements in Romania? Is that the one? Oh, it's, um, so it's from Maria Bukor, uh, and um, she asked about, uh, so it's a, it's a political party, um, the alliance, uh, um, 
so it's its acronym is AUR, which means gold in Romanian, but it's the Alliance uh, for the Unity of Romanians. And it's got all the kind of fundamentals of a populist party, and um, it managed to secure enough votes uh, in the 2020 elections to become the fourth largest party. So um, it's kind of got an interesting program uh, with respect to gender. And, and I know this because I spoke recently with a woman who's doing um, a, a project on women in this movement. So, um, you know, our is uh, very, uh, you know, it's anti-Russian, it's Eurosceptic, it's anti-corruption, it's very pro-church, it's got these four pillars, so faith, liberty, family, motherland. Um, you know, they're very um, critical of uh, EU policies, obviously, if they're Euro e Euroskeptic, but they're also critical in the way that uh, the, the peace in Poland is and also Fides, right? So this idea that, you know, that these values are being imposed upon a Romanian, they're anti-Romanian. Um, and their leader is actually, you know, a big fan of uh, Jaroslav Kaczynski. Um, but in any case, it's kind of unclear what's going to what 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 their politics will be with respect to gender. So as I said, I I interviewed the, this uh, or I spoke with this PhD student uh, about her findings, um, and uh, she said uh, Aur has the most women leader posi leadership positions uh, of the parties uh, in parliament. So. Um, and 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 they have and their party members are, are twenty three percent women are party members now whether that means they're going to promote gender friendly pro, uh, uh, policies right is a different matter but she did speak to women who are members in the party and they identified as feminists now what type of feminism she's trying to make sense of right because it's this nationalist feminism and our is anti LGBTQ so they are against you know, uh, obviously educating in schools about uh, uh, sexual minorities. Um, they also refer to kind of gender as an ideology, but um, they don't, they haven't talked at all about abortion. Um, and, um, and so these women who are a part of this, uh, this party um, identify as feminists, you know, and they see themselves as uh, active contributors, you know, uh, in terms of the workforce, um, you know, they also see the importance of family, right? So this idea of, uh, of the natural family and family values. And certainly that, you know, marriage should be between a, a man and a woman. But I had cut that part of my paper out because I felt like it was a little too speculative, speculative at this point, but it, it's, it's going to be interesting to see how this party develops. And, um, you know, they, they get a lot of the, you know, the rural vote, um, um, but they've also managed to, um, because they came um, uh, to, they, they managed to secure this uh, majority during COVID, um, I, I think this is part of uh, why they were successful because they're also critical of the state's COVID uh, policies, the, the forced lockdowns and the forced uh, vaccination campaign. Um, and there's a lot of skepticism about the vaccine uh, in Romania. So it's kind of, I, I asked her about, you know, to what degree is their popularity also rooted in kind of government's uh, response to COVID and kind of drawing on this uh, COVID skepticism. They also managed to secure a large diaspora vote, uh, which was surprising, right? Because the belief pr prior to this was that the, the diaspora uh, votes in a more kind of liberal fashion, but they're yeah. conservative. Um, and so, that's that's another kind of element that's that's an unknown. Like, what will happen in the next elections? Will the diaspora continue to support them? And what what parts of the population will now that kind of COVID is more or less under control? And so, um, yeah, it's kind of speculative. But I would imagine they would be supporting, uh, you know, the 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 ban on teaching. You know, if this was, the, you know, in terms of the vote when that's uh, undertaken, they'll be supporting that. But I, I really don't see them as supporting a ban on abortion. So. so thank you. I have one thing which I don't think that we should all be answering, but I want to put it on the table because I think this is something that is also uh, relevant in the United States and probably other parts of the world. Um, this question um, comes from um, Andrea Stoll from, um, from, uh, from Germany, I believe. Um, uh, it says women's organizations in Germany want to some, I suppose, want to protect their definition of sex, not gender, and they insist on safe rooms. That is, they define that women and especially children are not safe anymore if trans women define themselves as women. Okay, and this I think um, uh, they call themselves men, and, and then there's a whole bunch of um, of other uh, details. Um, so I just want to put that on the table for everyone um, as a as a um, a, a possible split or a crack in the 
in the feminist um, unity, uh, which many of us are fighting, but it nevertheless exists. And it's something that we should be thinking about in moving forward um, as, a, as both a political, but also as an analytical um, question. Yeah. Alyssa, did you want to say something about that? Or was that, oh no. Okay, Asbieta, you, you, your hand is up. Well, um, I think that uh, this issue uh, and the, the very, because I, I've been looking at this, uh, uh, this issues of division within the women's movement, within the feminist movement, basically, in Poland, uh, uh, Sweden, and Italy, comparatively, uh, through, through the last couple of years. And uh, I think that we can safely say that um, both anti-genderism and uh, unless in its sort of grassroots appeal and certain opposition towards for example against for example uh, trans rights within feminism are fueled to some extent by the ways in which gender has become uh, i would say um, lived especially uh, uh, by the younger generations uh, as truly fluid Right. So I think that um, we can, of course, the, the question is to what extent these reactions are connected. And we know that some, for example, gender critical groups in the US, like the Wolf, for example, got money from, you know, right wingers. But I don't think that this is only um, something that is connected to political coalitions or cooperation. I think that this is a part of reaction to the ways in which especially young people um, want to um, uh, sort of move from, and this is exactly what you said, Susan, at the beginning, right? From the analysis of gender as a, as a social construction and as a, as a uh, framework within which we all live towards identity, which is, you know, embodied lived on a very personal level. And right. I think that that this is this sort of there is a potential conflictual potential around that, which is of course strengthened by certain actors for political gains. Right, right, right. But I think that the the conflict at the or, or the questions at the root of that of of these issues are are real. Like you know, mm -hmm. if we define, uh, if we for example forego of binary genders what would be the common definition of the women's movement, right? Right. right. Can we still so, retain uh, that or not? I mean, it's, yeah, it's a huge yeah. issue. And a huge it's, a hu it's a huge issue, and I think we really need to face it. And I also would hope that it's possible to maintain both the structural definition of gender, which I feel to be very important as a critical understanding of social life, while also thinking about the individual or the fluid notions about gender. Um, I mean, I, I, can't, I can't imagine doing without either one of those. I'm, I'm, I'm proselytizing. <laughs> um, I'm terribly sorry to have to step in here. Um, right. uh, we are, we're quite a bit over time. Um, I would like to thank very much Professor Fodor, Professor Klotz, Professor Krolchuk, and, and Professor Messino for your generous uh, time today and for your contributions and to Professor Gal as well for responding uh, and moderating the discussion. Just a reminder, we have another event coming up in one week's time. Um, thank you again for sticking around today um, for this discussion. Thank you. And we'll see you in just a couple of more minutes. <laughs>